PQ-17 was the codename for an Allied Second World War convoy in the Arctic Ocean. In July 1942, the Arctic convoys suffered a significant defeat when convoy PQ-17 lost 24 of its 35 merchant ships during a series of heavy enemy daylight attacks, which lasted a week. On 27 June, the ships sailed eastbound from Havelfjord, Iceland for the port of Archangelsk, Soviet Union. The convoy was located by German forces on 1 July, after which it was shadowed continuously and attacked. The convoy's progress was being observed by the British Admiralty. First Sea Lord Admiral Dudley Pound, acting on information that German surface units, including the German battleship Tirpitz, were moving to intercept, ordered the covering force away from the convoy and told the convoy to scatter. However, due to vacillation by the German high command, the Tirpitz raid never materialized. The convoy was the first joint Anglo-American naval operation under British command in the war, as the close escort and the covering cruiser forces withdrew westward to intercept the presumed German raiders. The individual merchant ships were left without their escorting destroyers. In their ensuing attempts to reach the appointed Russian ports, the merchant ships were repeatedly attacked by Luftwaffe aeroplanes and U-boats. Of the initial 35 ships, only 11 reached their destination, delivering 70,000 short tons of cargo. The disastrous outcome of the convoy demonstrated the difficulty of passing adequate supplies through the Arctic, especially during the summer period of perpetual daylight. Background with the entry of the Soviet Union in the war, the British and American governments agreed to send unconditional aid to their Soviet allies. The Beaver Brick Harriman Anglo-American mission visited Moscow in October 1941, agreeing to a series of munitions deliveries to the Soviet Union. The most direct way to carry these supplies was by sea around the North Cape, through Arctic waters to the ports of Murmansk and Archangelsk. The agreement stated that the Soviet government was responsible for receiving the supplies in Soviet ships at British or American ports. However, since there were not enough ships for the quantities of aid being sent by the Western Allies to the Soviet Union, British and American ships began to constitute an increasing proportion of the convoy traffic. Although the defense of the Arctic convoys was the responsibility of the Royal Navy, Admiral Ernest King assigned Task Force 39, built around the carrier Uswasp and the battleship Hus Washington, to support the British. The first convoy sailed from the United Kingdom in August 1941, two months after the German invasion of the Soviet Union. By the spring of 1942, 12 more convoys had made the passage with the loss of only one out of 103 ships. From then on, the threat of attacks on the convoys increased. In 1941, the Kriegsmarine had already begun concentrating its strength in Norway in winter, both to prevent a repeated British attack, and to obstruct Allied supply lines to the Soviet Union. The battleship Tirpitz was moved to Trondheim in January, where she was joined by the pocket battleship Admiral Scheerum in March by the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper. Initial German dispositions had also directed battleships Scharnhorst and Eisenau and the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen to concentrate in Arctic waters, but these all fell victim to Allied air attacks and had to turn back for repairs. Moreover, the Germans had bases along the length of Norway, which meant, until escort carriers became available, Allied convoys had to be sailed through these areas without adequate defense against aircraft and submarine attack, admiralty instructions and diversionary operations. British naval intelligence in June reported the Germans' intention to bring out major naval units to attack the next eastbound convoy, east of Bear Island. Thus German forces would operate close to the Norwegian coast, with support of shore-based air reconnaissance and striking forces, with a screen of U-boats in the channels between Spitsbergen and Norway. Allied covering forces, on the other hand, would be without air support, 1,000 miles from their base, 
and with the destroyers too short on fuel to escort a damaged ship to harbour. To prevent such a situation, the Admiralty issued instructions on 27 June, which allowed the convoy to be turned back temporarily in order to shorten the distance to the nearest Allied base. In the event, enemy surface movements took place later than expected, making these instructions unnecessary. The Admiralty also instructed the safety of the convoy from surface attack to the westward of Bear Island depended on Allied surface forces, while to the eastward it was to be met by Allied submarines. Furthermore, the convoy's cruiser covering force was not to go east of Bear Island, unless the convoy was threatened by the presence of a surface force which the cruiser force could fight, nor to go beyond 25 degrees east under any circumstance. A decoy convoy was also organized to divert enemy forces, consisting of the 1st Minolaying Squadron and four colliers, escorted by HMS Sirius and Kurosawa, five destroyers and some trawlers. This diversionary force assembled at Scarpaflow for a wick, sailing two days after the convoy. German reconnaissance of Scarpa during the period of assembly failed to notice the diversion, which was also not sighted on its passage. The operation was repeated on 1 July, again without success. Additionally on 26 June the Admiralty took the opportunity to pass a westbound convoy QP-13, in conjunction with PQ-17. The former was made up of returning merchant ships from Archangelsch, with some ships leaving Murmansk. It consisted of 35 ships and was escorted by five destroyers, three corvettes, one anti-aircraft ship, three minesweepers, two trawlers and, as far as the Bear Island area, one submarine. It was sighted by German aircraft on 30 June and 2 July. However, QP-13 was not attacked, since the German tactic was to concentrate on eastbound convoys, rather than westbound convoys in ballast. A fresh ice reconnaissance done on 3 July found the passage north of Bear Island had widened. The Admiralty suggested the convoy should pass at least 50 miles north of it. The senior officer of the escort, Commander J. E. Broom, preferred to stay in the low visibility on the original route, and to make ground to the eastward. Rear Admiral L. H. K. Hamilton, in command of the cruiser squadron, later decided that a more northerly route was necessary ordered the SOE to alter the convoy's course to pass 70 miles north of Bear Island and later on to open to 400 miles from Banark, covering forces. The convoy's close escort was the first escort group under CDR, J. Broom, and included six destroyers, 11 corvettes, minesweepers or armed trawlers and two anti-aircraft auxiliaries. The destroyers were HMS Keppel, Fury, Leamington, Ledbury, Offer and Wilton. The anti-aircraft auxiliaries were HMS Palomares and Pozzerica. The other escorting ships were the corvettes HMS HMS Lotus, Poppy, La Mauin and Dianella, the minesweepers HMS Halcyon, Salamander and Britomart and the anti-submarine trawlers HMT Lord Middleton, Lord Austin, Escher and Northern Gem. In a more distant covering role was the 1st Cruiser Squadron, under the command of Rear Admiral L. H. K. Hamilton, consisting of the British cruisers HMS London and Norfolk, the American cruisers Aswichitar and Tuscaloosa, and four destroyers of which two were American. As further protection, the convoy was to be tracked at about 200 miles by home fleet battleships. The second, heavy covering force, under the command of Admiral John Tovey, was made up of the British aircraft carrier Victorious, battleship Duke of York, cruisers Cumberland and Nigeria, the American battleship Huss Washington, and nine destroyers. As the convoy began its preliminary movements, the covering forces planned by the Admiralty were moving to positions. Hamilton's first cruiser squadron left Sidus Fjord in the night from 30 June 1 July. 
It arrived in a covering position north of the convoy on 2 July. The cruisers were not sighted by the Germans until late on 3 July. The heavy cover force was shadowed for a short period while northeast of Iceland on 1 July, while the cruiser screen was refueling at Sidersfjord. It was shadowed for a short period early on 3 July, while in a covering position south of the convoy. Later that day, course was altered to the northward, to cross the convoy's track and to reach a position northwest of Bear Island. This would place Victorious within air striking range of the convoy on the morning of 4 July. This was calculated to occur at the same time at which a surface attack was expected to materialize. While en route to the new covering area, the task force was joined by HMS Manchester and Eclipse from Spitsbergen. Air reconnaissance of the Norwegian harbours had been hindered by weather, but information available showed German heavy units were probably moving northwards, and an air photograph of Trondheim late on 3 July confirmed Tirpitz and Hip had sortied. The flying boat patrol and the two lines of submarines between North Cape and Bear Island were being adjusted to cover the line of approach to the convoy as it moved eastwards. In view of the uncertainty of the two German ships' positions, Rear Admiral Hamilton decided to continue to provide close cover with the cruiser squadron and to pass east of Bear Island. Convoy movement, covering forces and escort. The convoy sailed from Haval Fjord on 27 June, under the command of Commodore John Dowding. In addition to the 34 merchant ships, an oiler for the escort, and three rescue ships sailed with the convoy. The escort was made up of six destroyers, four corvettes, three minesweepers, four trawlers, two anti-aircraft ships and two submarines. The route was longer than earlier convoys, since the ice allowed for a passage north of Bear Island with an evasive detour in the Barents Sea. Moreover, all the convoy was bound for Archangelsk because recent heavy air raids had destroyed most of Murmansk. One ship suffered mechanical failure just out of port and was forced to turn back. Another, SS Exford, turned back after sustaining ice damage. Part of the convoy ran into drifting ice in thick weather of the Denmark Strait. Two merchant ships were damaged and had to turn back. Grey Ranger was also damaged, her speed reduced to 8 knots, and since it was doubtful if she could face heavy weather, it was decided to transfer her to the fueling position northeast of Jan Mayen in exchange for the RFA Aldersdale. Shortly after it entered the open sea, PQ-17 was sighted and tracked by U-456, and shadowed continuously except for a few short intervals in fog. This was augmented by Luftwaffe BV-138s on 1 July. On 2 July, the convoy sighted the returning convoy QP-13. It suffered its first air attack by nine torpedo aircraft later the same day. The planes were unsuccessful, one being shot down. At 1300 on 3 July, PQ-17's destroyer screen was steering east to pass between Bear Island and Spitsbergen. A solitary aircraft scored a torpedo, hit on the morning of 4 July and there was an unsuccessful attack by six bombers in the evening. Us Wainwright successfully broke up an air attack on the convoy the same day. Later the same evening, another attack by 25 torpedo bombers took place, sinking SS William Hooper. Two ships were now sunk, and at least four aircraft were shot down. Convoy is to scatter. At 12.30 on 4 July, the Admiralty gave Hamilton permission to proceed east of 25 degrees east, should the situation demand, unless contrary orders were received from Admiral Tovey. This was a reversal of previous orders and as no information in Tovey's possession justified this change, Hamilton was ordered to withdraw when the convoy was east of 25 degrees east or earlier at his discretion, unless the Admiralty assured him Tirpitz would not be met. At 18.58 the Admiralty informed Hamilton further information was expected shortly and instructed him to remain with the convoy pending further instructions. 
At 2111, the Admiralty sent a message prefixed, most immediate, ordering Hamilton to withdraw westwards at high speed. This was due to U-boat information, a fact not shared with Hamilton. At 21.23, the Admiralty, in a message prefixed, immediate, ordered the convoy to disperse and proceed to Russian ports owing to threat from surface ships. At 21.36, the Admiralty sent another, most immediate, message, ordering the convoy to scatter. Admiral Hamilton, Commander Broom and Commodore Dowding took these signals to indicate an attack by tear pits was imminent. The convoy was immediately ordered to scatter, with the escorting destroyers ordered to join the cruiser force and the merchantmen to proceed independently. The Admiralty's decision and orders would not have been so vehement had only British warships been concerned but the idea the first joint Anglo-American operation under British command might involve the destruction of American as well as British units may well have influenced the decisions of First Sea Lord Pound. The Allied cruiser squadron was already beyond the standing orders set by the Admiralty and if no new orders had gone out, the cruisers would have had to withdraw some time afterwards in any case. The earlier cruiser movement did not influence the tactical situation but in light of later knowledge, the decision was deemed precipitate. Convoy losses. When the order to scatter the convoy was received, it had covered more than half of its route and lost three ships. The consequences for the merchantmen were dire. The ships were spread over a wide area, stripped of mutual protection and the trained escort, and being bombed by a large number of planes, on fire in the ice, abandoning ship. Six U-boats approaching on the surface, with the majority of the escorts ordered to return to Scarpa Flow. Only the close escort of anti-aircraft auxiliaries, corvettes, minesweepers and armed trawlers was left to protect the scattered ships. On 5 July, six merchantmen, including SS Fairfield City and SS Daniel Morgan, were sunk by the Luftwaffe and six more by four U-boats. Among the losses that day were SS Pancraft, Washington, Carlton, Onamu, the Commodore's flagship River Afton, Empire Byron and Peter Kerr. Commodore Dowding's refusal to accept defeat contributed to the rescue of most of the ships that eventually survived the convoy. SS Paulus Potter had been abandoned by her crew after an aerial attack on 5 July. The ship was boarded by sailors from U-255 on 13 July. After taking the ship's documents and flag, KPTLT, Reacher sank the Potter with a torpedo. On 6 July, SS Pan Atlantic was sunk by the Luftwaffe and SS John with a spoon by U-255. On 7-8 July, five more ships were sunk, including SS Olapana and SS Alcoa Ranger. The remaining escort withdrew into the Arctic Ocean on 9 July but the merchant ships suffered no more that day. The last losses were SS Hoosier and SS El Capitan on 10 July. The Luftwaffe flew over 200 sorties and lost only five aircraft in exchange for the eight merchantmen. On receiving the third order to scatter on 4 July 1942, RNVRT, LT Leo Grad while commanding the ASW adapted 575 long tons Middlesbrough built trawler HMS Escher concluded that as he was heading north to the Arctic ice shelf, nothing prevented him from escorting merchantmen. Leading his convoy of Ersha and three U.S. merchant vessels, the Panamanian registered Troubadour, Ironclad and Silver Sword, he proceeded north, using only a sextant and the Times World Geographic pocket book. On reaching the Arctic ice pack, the convoy stuck fast and so the ships stopped engines and then banked their fires. Gradwell arranged a defense, formulated around the fact that Troubadour was carrying a cargo of bunkering coal and drums of white paint. The crews painted all the vessels white, covered decks with white linen, and arranged the Sherman tanks on the merchant vessel's decks into a defensive formation, with loaded main guns. After a period of waiting and having evaded Luftwaffe reconnaissance aircraft finding themselves unstuck, they proceeded to the Matochkin Strait. 
They were found there by a flotilla of corvettes, who escorted the four-ship convoy plus two other merchant vessels to the Russian port of Archangel. Arriving on 25 July, Gradwell was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross on 15 September 1942. In the voyage to the Russian ports, some of the ships and lifeboat craft took refuge along the frozen coast of Novaya Zemlya, landing at Matochkin. The Soviet tanker Azerbaijan had lost her cargo of linseed oil and much of SS Winston Salem's cargo had been jettisoned in Novaya Zemlya. Many of the ship's locations were unknown, in spite of searches by coastal command aircraft which had proceeded to North Russia after their patrols, and by minesweepers and corvettes in the waters. A fortnight elapsed before the results of these attacks and the fate of the various ships of the convoy were fully known. Of the 34 ships which had left Iceland, 23 were sunk and 11 made port. Two British, four American, one Panamanian and two Russian merchant ships reached Archangel. Two American ships, the SS Samuel Chase and Benjamin Harrison, docked at Murmansk. The total deliveries amounted to 70,000 short tons out of the 200,000 short tons which had started from Iceland.